Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Shafi Law YouTube channel. My name is Cheyenne Shafi, and today we're going to be making up for lost time in a big way by tackling a huge and incredibly important topic. That is, what married couples can expect after a husband or wife has been charged with domestic assault in Ontario. This means we're going to be talking about the major legal, logistical, and emotional challenges husbands and wives can expect from the moments after a charge to the conclusion of a court case. Now, a couple of pointers before we dive in. Number one, today's video is a companion piece to a blog article I published earlier this month called A Lawyer's Guide for Married Couples Facing Domestic Charges. So if reading is your thing, there's a link in the description below to that article as well as a host of other written materials on domestic violence law and criminal law generally. Number two, on that point, today's video continues to build on my long-term project of helping Canadians by demystifying the legal system. On my website and on this channel, you're going to find plenty of articles that I've spent hours preparing. And if you want to stay informed and you support the work that I'm doing, hit the subscribe button now, hit the like button, and I promise to pay it forward by publishing more materials about Canada's legal system. And lastly, number three, folks, I need to make a very important announcement about some of the amazing feedback I've been getting on my previous videos on YouTube. I realize domestic charges are an emotional and confusing affair, and I'm heartened by the fact that so many of you have found answers in my previous publications. But when those answers spawn new questions, the best way to get advice is by picking up the phone and talking to a lawyer. As much as I want to help, for a whole host of reasons I cannot and do not give legal advice on the internet. This channel is not a place for legal advice. It's a place for you to get information on how the justice system works, how you use that information, whether it's to satisfy your curiosity or to better understand and talk about your legal problem is up to you. With all that out of the way, let's now turn to our main topic, starting with a discussion of what everyone charged with domestic assault in Ontario should know. Now, about a year ago, I published a video on what to do if you've been charged with domestic assault. The takeaways from that video apply equally to husbands and wives in the domestic context. Regardless of whether your spouse wanted you charged when they first contacted the police or now want the charges dropped, all Ontarians facing domestic assault charges should know the following three basic facts. Number one, the vast majority of domestic cases take at least several months to resolve in court with most minor cases taking somewhere in the range of three to six months. So make the necessary housing and child access arrangements now, and don't expect your domestic charges to be disposed of at the first court appearance. I'm here to tell you that this almost never happens. Number two, whatever you do, follow your bail. Even if your husband or wife desperately wants you back home, a failure to comply with your release can and will result in your arrest if it's detected by police. A desire to communicate is not a defense, and the police simply will not care if your spouse was the one who initiated the contact. And number three, the best thing you can do for yourself in the early stages after a charge is to hire an experienced domestic assault lawyer. As I've talked about elsewhere, domestic charges are unique in the criminal justice system. From investigation to the termination of a domestic violence case, these types of cases attract special procedures, policies, and as a result, defense tactics. As you await your first court appearance, do yourself a favor. Hire a lawyer who knows what they're doing. A lawyer will not only bring you mental relief, but also show you how to make the best use of the time between the point of your arrest and your first court appearance. For those of you desperate to get back home to your spouses and your children, 
This means a drastically improved chance of getting a better outcome faster. Now, with those three general principles in mind, let's zoom in on the special difficulties married couples encounter when they face domestic assault charges in Ontario, starting with the ever-popular no-contact order. Although confronting a domestic charge is never easy, married couples face an especially hard road. That's because more than in dating or even common law relationships, Marriage signifies that the life of the spouse is intertwined at every level, from the bills to in-laws to childcare. Because of this, the first instinct of most married couples after one spouse has been arrested is to reach out to their partner. This is obviously completely understandable, because the charge often leaves both parties feeling confused, shocked, and alone. Unfortunately, once domestic charges have been laid, a no-contact order will stand in the way of communication. In my experience, this order is the single most significant source of pain and frustration for married couples facing domestic charges in Ontario. Let's first talk about what a domestic no-contact order is. A no-contact order prohibits a spouse charged with domestic assault from communicating with their partner. They're typically imposed by the police on what we call an undertaking, but they can also be contained on a court-ordered release order. Now, most no-contact orders are paired with something we call a radius condition, and this prevents the charged spouse from going back to the matrimonial home or near the complainant. The radius condition can contain exceptions for the retrieval of property, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Although no-contact orders are typically limited to the complainant, they can and sometimes do extend to other family members, including children, if those people were present and are considered witnesses by the police or the courts. How long do no-contact orders last? The rule here is very simple. A domestic no-contact order remains in place for the duration of the court case, unless and until it is varied. Can a no-contact order be lifted? This is an incredibly popular question, and the answer is yes. In some cases, domestic no-contact orders can be lifted, and I discuss this process in another video. In short, the process is called a bail variation, and the most effective way of getting one done is with the assistance of a lawyer. Let's now shift gears and talk about one of the most significant emotional obstacles clients facing domestic charges will face, and that's what I call relationship strain. Relationship strain is the pain and uncertainty clients feel about the state of their marriage after a domestic charge. For many couples, a domestic charge marks a clear breaking point, with separation and divorce looming on the horizon. For most, though, the marriage landscape after a charge is a lot more ambiguous. In my experience, having represented hundreds of individuals in domestic cases, most domestic charges are the result of relationship dynamics that have been present in a marriage for years, sometimes even decades. For these kinds of couples who have learned to live with these dynamics, the involvement of police doesn't necessarily signal the end, but a fork in the road. And here again, we turn to the no-contact order, because what makes this time especially difficult for married couples is their inability to communicate. Husbands and wives are left to process complex, and powerful emotions without knowing what their partner really wants. These feelings run the gamut from resentment and anger to the most desperate kinds of remorse. What do I recommend my clients do when they're coping with relationship strain? My take on this is simple, and it's based on over a decade of experience. They should see a therapist. In fact, they should get all the help they can with all the problems they ever suspected they might have. 
from substance abuse to anger management to understanding the complex picture of their own mental health. It should come as no surprise that most of my law firm's clients are men with often stereotypically male attitudes. They obviously experience trouble coping with the stress of being charged and not knowing which direction their marriage is headed in, and yet they refuse help. They think there's no point talking to someone about their feelings, and some even worry that if they do end up taking counseling, this may send the wrong message, that they're admitting they've done something wrong. I'm here to put both of those objections to bed. First of all, those clients who reject the value of counseling simply haven't tried it. In my experience, I've referred hundreds of clients to see therapists, and virtually every single one of them has thanked me for it when the case is finished. Think of the personal benefits of counseling this way. Your domestic case is going to take several months to resolve no matter what you do. Now, you can spend that time coping with the case, or you can spend it learning, growing, and laying the foundations for a healthier relationship with your current partner or the next one in the future. Even more importantly, I'm here to tell you that counseling will help your criminal case. Period. Full stop. Counseling is not an admission of guilt. It's a signal that you take the allegations seriously, that you have the insight to work on the causes of the conflict within you and your relationship, and in the result, a sign that you pose a much lower risk of ever finding yourself back before the courts again. Folks, I used to be a prosecutor, and I know how most prosecutors think. Unless a case is extremely serious, most Crown Attorneys are reasonable, sensible people who will look for a reason to give married couples another shot. That's why, at the start of every case, I put my Crown glasses on and examine the brief looking not just for what the client thinks the problem was, but more importantly, what the Crown reading the file will think the problem was. With the right approach, Counseling is far from an admission of guilt. It's an effective tool for getting domestic charges dropped. Now let's switch gears and talk about accessing your possessions and your children while you have an active domestic case. As a starting point, it's important that clients adjust their expectations early on and accept the fact that responding to domestic charges, especially in the family context, is not going to be an exercise in convenience. In practical terms, this will mean saying goodbye to your favorite pair of sneakers or your stereo system while you live away from home. More importantly, it is going to mean you may have to navigate the world of joint bank accounts and home bills without direct contact with your spouse. And of course, decisions will need to be made about where the children will live and with whom. Now, in most cases, the health of the marriage and the intentions of the parties with respect to getting back together are going to decide how easily these issues are dealt with. If the parties want to reconcile, issues like finances and childcare tend to be easy enough to work through. On the other hand, if the domestic charges have led to a breakdown in the marriage, it may become necessary to engage in the difficult exercise of decoupling the finances or obtaining the help of a family lawyer to gain access to the children. Focusing for a moment on the issue of property specifically, there are steps clients can take to retrieve their things after a domestic charge. The starting point always is to carefully review the conditions of your release order with the assistance of a lawyer. If the married couple was cohabiting, living together, prior to the charge, the release order will usually permit going back to the residence on one occasion in the company of a uniformed police officer to get your things. If that's the case, I highly recommend clients make a list of items they intend to pick up before simply showing up with a police officer in tow. As they make this list, clients should be mindful that the police are not a moving company. Your list of property, therefore, should be kept simple 
and it should avoid any items which could trigger a dispute on scene about ownership. If further property retrieval becomes necessary, the easiest solution is often to enlist the help of a third party. In very rare cases where, for example, the matrimonial home is being sold and the parties need to return to the property on multiple occasions, a bail variation permitting those attendances may become necessary. Turning now to the issue of children, clients who want to see or speak to their children after domestic charge should again start by examining their release documents. The release document will set a baseline of permissible and impermissible contact and will also include exceptions, often relating to the children specifically. In my experience, after an arrest, any children in the family will usually remain with the uncharged spouse at the matrimonial home. The husband or wife facing the charges is then permitted to communicate with the children either with the assistance of a third party or pursuant to a family court order. Now, generally speaking, family court orders are only necessary where the parties cannot see eye to eye with respect to accessing the children. In the majority of cases, the uncharged spouse typically remains supportive of co-parenting. Access is then facilitated through the use of what we call a mutually agreeable third party, meaning that the complainant retains a right to choose who can act as an intermediary. Folks, this has been a mouthful and an earful, and I hope sincerely that it has been helpful to Ontarian couples facing the long and difficult road of domestic assault charges in the province. I've been practicing in this field for over a decade, and I continue to find the process of representing clients in domestic cases an endless source of challenge and growth. As the years go by, and especially as it relates to married couples, I increasingly view myself not as a domestic assault lawyer, but as a lawyer focused on family reunification. I've learned that the most effective defense in cases involving married couples isn't to pound the table, but to cut with the grain of my client's stories and the stories of a marriage. I am very proud of my track record of success in this space, and I hope that some of that comes through on this video. Domestic assault charges can feel like earth-shattering events, but it's also possible to view them as tremendous opportunities for growth. If there's one thing I want my married clients to take away from this video, it's this. The time you have away from your partner isn't just an opportunity to beat the charges. It's a chance to reflect, to heal, to course correct. With the right legal advice, not only is there a good chance you'll get the charges dealt with, even dropped, but for those of you who want it, a more loving marriage might be waiting for you on the other side. As always, feel free to call or email my law firm if you or your loved one is facing domestic charges anywhere in the province. And don't forget, folks, to hit the like button and the subscribe button. I hope you found this material helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.